So, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to move into uh, the main event for the evening. I'd like to welcome uh, all of our panelists up to the stage. One thing I'd like to, to say is uh, we've been very fortunate with this event that we've had a... Uh, oh, okay. There we go. Much better. We've had a... Uh, more attendees sign up for this event than, than we've ever had in the past. Uh, so thanks to all of you guys for being here with us tonight. And also for our panel, I think we've had more panelists than, uh, than we've ever had. So we have had a little bit of a reorganization, and uh, we want to keep the show on track for tonight. So first off, I'd like to thank our panelists for being here. We've got an esteemed group, industry leaders from government, military, and, and commercial sectors. So I'd like to start off with, uh, with each of you guys being here to just talk about um, what you're doing in industry and, and what background that you're coming from. Joe, could we start off with you? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me and um, listening in for those who are streaming today. Um, Joe Billingsley, I work over at the uh, National Defense University in uh, Washington, D.C., specifically at the College of Information and Cyberspace as a Director of Strategic Engagement. In addition to that, uh, I also uh, am an adjunct at a couple different universities in the area teaching uh, cyber and strategy related type of courses. Um, also, uh, founder uh, of a nonprofit called the Military Cyber Professionals Association, and uh, wear other hats uh, throughout the community uh, spanning government uh, and particularly the defense community, um, academia. And, uh, and also uh, the nonprofit world. Uh, I'm an Army veteran, uh, served alongside TJ uh, over at uh, Army Cyber Command uh, wow. years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, very happy to be here. Thank you, Joe. Denise? Um, thank you for having me. My name is Denise Lake. Um, I work for the Army. I'm a cybersecurity branch chief for um, PM Mission Command. Um, pretty much PM Mission Command is responsible for the command and control applications that are provided to all of our soldiers. Good evening. Sean? Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Karina, TJ, and, and everyone else for having me here. Uh, my name is Sean Mulchandani. I work at Accenture, so I'm, I'm part of the cloud security practice there. As a side note, I actually lead their AWS security practice globally, but I'm going to cast that hat aside for this evening. And <laughs> And uh, <laughs> you're going to boo me off stage, yeah. And uh, well, outside of that, I mean, of course, spam. But I mean, that that aside, of course, we have so many clients that are multi-cloud, so dealing uh, constantly with AWS, Azure, GCP across the board, uh, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud environments. Outside of that, have a startup that's actually in the data analytics space. I began my career in the defense sector, so I used to work at Lockheed, and then also uh, in the cyber forensic space for the DoD. Thank you, John. Frank? Hi. My name is Frank Sugar. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Airstone. We do uh, cybersecurity consulting. I'd like to draw your attention to my business partner, Jason, uh, who comes to these things more often, so you'll, you'll probably want to circle up with him. We are not in the cloud business. We do cybersecurity work. We do a lot of penetration testing, a lot of uh, security controls analysis for both government and commercial entities. I think that our view of the thing is probably a lot more working level than, than what you're accustomed to. Like I said, we do a lot of pen testing. You know, we do a lot of banging away at systems that people are, are actually using. Uh, I think you're going to find my answers are maybe a little different from, you know, what the cloud folks are going to say about how cool things are. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Way we go. All right. <laughs> So I, I did want to say that, uh, that our panels, I think, are more informal than, uh, than other organizations that you go from. We do have C questions to start the conversation, but none of it's rehearsed. Really, we want to let our, our experts in our panel open up the discussion and, and take us away from there. So start off with the first question, um, not to anybody in general, but feel free to hop in as you see fit. What is today's cybersecurity landscape in government, and what are the top priorities in that industry? I'll, uh, I'll start off by saying that <clears throat> from my vantage point and based on my experience uh, as I came up um, as a uniformed officer in the Army and spending plenty of time with the, uh, the Navy and, and also various other parts of the Department of Defense and, and U.S. government uh, writ large, um, 
still very much in a state of evolution and uh, maturation. Um, there is a lot of room for improvement. Um, it's very much hit or miss. Um, and by the way, these are just my opinions uh, as Joe Billingsley, not the opinions of the U.S. government or anything like that. And I think probably Thank same you, for you as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, there's a, there really is a lot of, uh, a lot of work to, to go. Um, it really is hit or miss as far as getting somebody on your team um, that actually understands what they're supposed to understand uh, with regards to technology and anything related to it. Um, so, uh, so that's why I personally decided to invest my, uh, my professional life in the field of education. Uh, all related to cyber-related type of topics, um, just because I saw that that was the greatest need and the most meaningful investment of my time uh, that will bear all kinds of uh, ROI. I think my statement is that, is that you know more and more cybersecurity has gotten to the forefront of our military leadership, and um, they're becoming more educated, more trained in, in these endeavors, and. It's really up to us to kind of ensure that you know we provide them that support and um, the skill set in order for them to enable that for all of our military systems. Um, yeah, just to chime in. I think on the state of at least cloud security and cloud migrations overall, I think we've we've seen from I guess an EO two years ago. There's quite a lot of activity. I think we're almost at an inflection point. When you consider, I think Poneman recently did a survey, and there are about 50, 55% of all respondents from across government sectors and entities actually said, we're very excited and eager to move into cloud. That said, two-thirds actually stated security as their number one concern and inhibitor. Happy to talk through some of that and what we've seen, what I've seen uh, later. But aside from that, you're also seeing that while shadow IT or FedRAMP FedRAMP comes up everywhere, right? But if you look at different services and vendors that are getting approved, I mean, Oracle's released new services, Netscope's got their service, they're, they're capably approved a month or so or two months ago. So the government's moving faster. In fact, they've, they've even had like crowdsource calls for, okay, how do we actually accelerate the FedRAMP approval for process and onboarding process? I think the more vendors, the more cloud service providers, and everybody that gets across the board, and even for, for the large CSPs to get additional services that are compliant, uh, that creates a very healthy competition. It actually provide, it, it inspires more confidence within agencies of the government as they have more security capabilities and cloud native security capabilities, cloud first security capabilities at their disposal. Yeah, I think in the interest of time, do we want everybody right, to answer every question? I, I got something to say if you wanted to. All right. But, no, go ahead, Frank. Well, I, I was just going to say, we, 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 do, we like to talk about what the government doesn't do well, and there are a host of things that the government doesn't do well, and, and the libertarian in me could, could run on that point for a long time. There are a couple things the government does in cybersecurity super, super well, like better than anybody. You know, nobody does multi-level security like the government. We see we see all the time customers that that they they don't have any segregation right they don't have any understanding that this thing is more secret than that thing or that this thing belongs to these folks but not these folks over here and we've seen uh, an immense corporations really big commercial entities who have no concept of the the separation or the multi level security of of their <clears throat> you know, their operational networks versus their data networks, it's, it's stunning how good the government is in some ways. Thank you, Frank. We, we've touched on a few points talking about cyber talent and, and what those gaps in the industry are. So next question for the panel is talking about, with these challenges in mind, how do we maintain a cyber workforce and not only attract that talent, but also retain it? I think uh, part of it is uh, definitely listening to the demands of the community, the, the target audience that we want to recruit and, and retain, um, and really prioritize it and resource that. Um, you know, in the U.S. government, like in any organization, uh, there are competing interests, there are competing, um, you know, uh, uh, 
different directions that resources uh, could get siphoned off to. Uh, so it really takes a lot of effort on the part of very senior leaders to understand why they need to resource these uh, recruiting and retaining initiatives, um, including uh, educational opportunities, and you know where folks are stationed and, and serve throughout the, the government, um, and really follow through on that. I mean, a lot of these efforts, particularly with all the bureaucracy involved, uh, whether you're talking about um, things needing to be written into legislation and everything that goes into that to, to prepare that, um, I mean, these are multi-year efforts that really take a sustained approach and, and a real more strategic vision. Go ahead, Denise. Have to. Well, I, I think from my perspective as a, a branch chief of a team of cybersecurity professionals, I have um, folks on my team that run a gamut from experts in um, hardware security to experts in software security and um, to experts in network security. And um, it's a really strong team, and it, it takes a lot of care and feeding to ensure that not only do I ensure that they can get involved in some of the compliance aspects, but it also help drive the engineering. One of the things in helping retain some of this talent is that a lot of this talent's like, you know, you make them get all these certifications, you make them get all these degrees and training to be qualified for these positions, and we end up um, pitching them whole in them into these positions where they're just focusing on compliance. Um, making sure, so one of the things is the care and feeding of our folks to ensure that they can do not just the compliance, but also help develop and define what the system has to do. You kind of need to have them see the scope. If you pigeonhole them, it's like you end up having people doing great things and developing cool stuff, but not thinking about cybersecurity. And people screaming about cybersecurity, but then, you know, not able to help influence the design in the first place. Thank you, Denise. I think from an, I want to cue off his previous, my co panelist's previous point. There's some things the government does really well and doesn't do really well, right? Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, just as an example, I used to work on really cutting edge cyber forensics uh, stuff and reverse engineering these. Uh, it's amazing, but you never hear about it. I think some of it is just getting the word out there to attract some of the right talent. The other part is working with the right partners and, and getting some of that talent in to energize your core and, and the rest of your workforce. And, and to be honest, where they need to pick up the pace is kind of lower the barriers to getting proof of concepts up. You know, how, how long does it actually take to initiate even a pilot or get an ATO, ATP to try anything new? I've come out of meetings, I think, in the last two days where it's like, you can't run even a pilot in a sandbox because said service is not FedRAMP approved. Um, that's saying something. I mean, that, that kills innovation, and especially the youth that's coming on does not want to hear that. So. Thank you, Sean. So thinking about not, not this crowd, but thinking about our customers, and we, we work with several government agencies, um, some quasi-government agencies, and lots of little commercial folks. I, I would tell you that if you're talking about um, maintaining the cyber workforce, you're, you're actually having the wrong conversation, for, at least for our customers. They, because they're not maintaining a cyber workforce, they're trying to find one, right? They, they don't have the people to maintain. They, they cannot recruit them, and they know they can't recruit them because there are so many jobs available to a qualified cyber person that if, if you're a medium-sized company and you're going to bring somebody in to be the cyber guy, right, you're expecting that person to, to know a lot of stuff that, that they don't know even if they're a really solid security person. So, so I think our, our question has got to be, as a community, how do we make a use of a limited pool of people across an almost unlimited pool of need? And, and I think that's a different, maybe, answer than, than we might have been looking for. But again, with our customers, uh, that's the kind of problem they're trying to solve, is how do they get this stuff done at all? forget retaining talent. And I think that's key because it's like a cybersecurity engineer, they're not all built the same. Like my team, I have people that if you want to understand hardware security, the firmware, cross-domain solutions, that is a specific expertise. 
I can't also have them do software terms. Because right? it's not the same skill set. There's different skill sets, and they're all built differently. So when you're thinking about building your team, you need to make sure, okay, this is my system. What are the different components of my systems? And what are the different cyber skill, cybersecurity-specific skill sets that team needs to have? And, and that's, it, it varies. And you just can't say, all right, you're the cybersecurity person, engineer. Go do something. People, you know? people are never fungible. Right, yeah. you you never plug and play human beings. Even even if you would like to, people are never fungible. They're never exactly you know they're not like dollar bills. You can't just trade one for another. You always get something. You always give something up with every time you make that change. But I do want to cue off that just one last point, right? And to that extent, you can't also continue with the model of we have a network architect, we have a security architect. You can't get super siloed or specialized. When do you see the big picture? I mean, I love that the government's actually talking a lot about zero trust in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. It takes somebody with an intent vision that says, okay, let's talk Microsoft, right, and Azure very specifically. Can we, in, what's, what does a basic zero trust model that's completely cloud native look like? It's Azure DDoS protection. It's Azure Firewall. Mm -hmm. Then it gets into a couple of things, and then NSGs and ASGs. And then you have your workloads. I mean, and then walk me through, if I implement all of this the right way, I'm not even talking in terms of AIP and everything else that we can enable and, and safeguard a cloud environment, but walk me through how difficult it is for an adversary to actually penetrate one or more workloads if I have everything locked down. So it does take, I guess, new skill sets. It does take cross-team like functionality to, to see the end-to-end -end picture. So we're not saying... Well, I'm network, I don't want NSGs, they're too hard to maintain, but the application security guy comes and says, these are my, these are my WAF rules, we get, we get a third party WAF, and then somebody else has to configure the WAF, somebody has to configure WAF rules. It doesn't work. So you, you do need uh, cross-team collaboration, you do need people building out their skills in a horizontal manner. I want to expand on a, a few of the points. I think, uh, Frank, you brought up a great point saying that we're not so much looking at retaining the talent. We're looking at building a cyber mission force. And, and Joe, you mentioned that of, of all the things that the different industries do well, government, military does a good job in building but also documenting that cyber workforce. So one thing that I've come across in my experience is cyber as a discipline is subjective. It's based on business requirements of the organization. Something you'll do as an engineer in this company is different than that company and so on. How do we standardize it in building this workforce and what are some of the models that are out there? So I'm going to throw the DOD 8571 on the table right there. Of, of all the things that we can lay out a framework for a cyber mission force, that's a way to standardize it. Reason being is it looks at industry certification as at least a, a baseline to say if I'm an information assurance manager, I should go this track to, to at least have a foundation of knowledge to operate in a business space and to be able to take that common overlay between industries. So one of the paths that's, that's worked well for me in industry and in building cyber teams, especially on the, the operational side, is to take someone fresh out of school, maybe a student with an IT degree or, or maybe somebody working in a, a different section of technology and, and try to move them into these types of work roles. So. A certification track that, that's yielded utility is to start with CompTIA A+. It gives a foundation in IT concepts. You can then roll uh, personnel into Networking Plus to look at TCP IP, round it out with CompTIA Security Plus just to give a foundational baseline. At that point, you look at something like an EC Council Certified Ethical Hacker to say, all right, you have a foundation in computers and networking and security. Now think like an attacker, put that in place. At that point, you could look at something like an ISC squared associate, CISSP, depending on the timelines, but that's a track that you can rapidly push personnel through. At that point, it doesn't mean that they will or will not be a successful uh, cyber operator, but at least they have the foundation to operate within different industries and, and understand the concepts at play. Um, you mentioned the standardization piece across the uh, cyber community. I think um, a very useful uh, framework that's been developed, at least you know, for the uh, for the Department of Defense community, is a DoD Cyber Workforce Framework, uh, based on what's done uh, been done by Nice. Um, and really, each one of those categories and work roles um, are very specific, with tons of KSAs associated with them, 
and, uh, and very specific courses and, and, uh, and all kinds of, of different resources and, and requirements associated with each one of them. And I think that that's definitely part of the stepping stone uh, to, to get to where we need to be. Um, also, you know, something that, that you mentioned, um, the, the role of certifications and, you know, kind of training and certifications versus education. Uh, this is one thing that, that's always on my mind, which I think is helpful to think about here, is that when you are approaching education with the intent of really understanding the domain, the cyberspace domain, and really have that understanding from the physical layer up, as opposed from the application level down, then you're really a lot less surprised as far as like what the art of the possible is, um, and gives you an incredible amount more flexibility. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in between, of course, um, but really I find people are a lot less surprised when they understand it from that bottom-up approach. And gives you a lot more flexibility then to go across the various you know, components of, of the community, whatever role that you're particularly filling. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Moving on to our next question, I know this was quite an exciting one, and we could probably go for uh, for quite a bit of time tonight. But uh, let's move on to how should an organization think about cyber defense in the cloud, especially in perspective to more of a, a traditional on-premise model. Um, so, from my perspective, cybersecurity—an organization needs to think about a cloud cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. You have to realize as a mission owner, you have certain responsibilities and the cloud service provider is also has certain responsibilities. And the mission owner also has to make sure that they are um, utilizing a, a cybersecurity service provider to ensure that you know, what they're doing in the cloud is secure. But it really is a balance between what security controls the mission owner is doing versus what the cloud service provider is doing. And the, that mission owner needs to ensure that they have a team that understands what that balance is. Um, and one of the other key things that an organization needs to make sure they understand is that if your system isn't secure when it's on premise, it's not going to be more secure when you put it in the cloud. Um, so making sure you understand what your security controls are, who's doing what to whom, what that balance is, um, that's really where it has to kind of all kind of pull together. The, the last time I did one of these, we, we had this same kind of discussion. I said, here's the thing, a crappy application on-prem is a crappy application in the cloud. Yeah. And there was this kind of quiet, and I heard people like this, and I was like, <laughs> what's happening? And someone was like, could you say that again? And I was like, what? Well, I mean, they don't get necessarily that much better. And people, it's like, that wasn't that insightful, people. You know, it, yeah. it just wasn't, but there you have it. I would say it can be even crappier in the cloud, right? I mean, when, when I heard lift and shift the first mm -hmm. time, I said, okay, what are you trying to do? You're trying to replicate it, pick up the VM, clone it in, you're done. No, 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 it's worse than that. You're hairpinning half your traffic back, and then you're opening all these ports. I think the gentleman presenting earlier made a comment about, and, and you made a comment, TJ, about firewall ports just keep getting wider and wider and wider, right? And then for the fear of losing, somebody's very fearful about losing their job, literally, and not shutting something down because something mission critical went down and that's, that spells doom for them. And so you're just getting, and then you're, you're hairpinning traffic sometimes, sorry, back, and then it's over, whether you're hairpinning back, traffic back over untrusted certificates, you're widening your ports over time, um, you're just saying no to certain cloud-related controls. Mm -hmm. I would, it goes back to also, I think you, you showed the demo of the just-in-time. It goes back to just understanding what are the capabilities offered by the cloud. So I not only have to build, I have to build on my, what my colleague said, not just a shared responsibility model, but exactly what capabilities are there and, and how they map. Because you don't need to leave port 22 open and manage a ton of firewall rules if you do this. But half the people operating today will tell you it doesn't exist. I got told yesterday, just, and I'm sorry to bring up an AWS example, but I got told yesterday, well, we need this third party tool We've used it on-prem. We're going to, we were very happy with it. We need to keep using it in the cloud. And we're going to lift and, and that was a lift and shift. Because they won't subscribe to it through the marketplace. They're then putting a new server as part of shared services just to do SSH in the machines or patching, etc. And, and their whole premise was, well, we don't, we can't tell you who logged into which machine if we don't use this. I said, not true. Here's three cloud-native services that you chain, and this is how you do it with that particular cloud service provider. Mm -hmm. 
you showed us just how easy it is with the JIT to do it. I think it just comes back to a fundamental understanding, a little bit of time, and understanding all the massive investment the CS CSPs are putting in. I think Intel Graph is a, a wonderful example of that, right? And how many people know about it? Sorry. Sean, you touched on an interesting point to talk about one of the challenges in the cloud is is how we defend the perimeter and we start to open things up and, and you don't realize that, that that scale opens and we evolve risk over time. Do you feel that that's possibly a movement from accessibility uh, towards security or, or maybe vice versa? Not quite sure. I said. So if we have firewall rules in place and, and we challenge them by opening more over time, is it possibly a, a switch towards a more accessible environment over a more secure environment? I would say so. But, and then part of that, I think, I think the way I, I would like to answer that is also when people are first migrating to the cloud, I've seen so many of these documents that are, that are showing, here's our journey to cloud, here's our strategy. You won't... I can count on, on the number of times on one hand, the number of times I've actually seen even certain cloud native services being part of those documents, right? So if you talk about Azure Security Center, how do you use AIP, how do I use NSGs and ESGs, those are the most basic things. Or if you're talking AWS, like how do I use, like there's no mention of guard duty, there's no mention of anything, there's no mention of ATP on the Azure side. And then when it comes to, I think it was mentioned earlier, you push stuff to Azure, you push stuff to Azure, and then it's about reverse engineering or retrofitting, and they, they just give up because of time, lack of time, lack of money, lack of both. And then it's like, let's just do what gets us there at this point, if, if that answers the question. Absolutely, you also touched on another interesting point. Certain providers will do one thing better over another. Do we have to pick one cloud or another, or is it possible to, to operate in a, in a multi-cloud environment? And I think, I think we're definitely scratching at the, the surface of, of something interesting and in, in how multi-cloud environments would work based on strengths and weaknesses and, and interoperability. Just a quick comment there. I've seen people rush into a multi-cloud environment before they've gotten one right. Far too often. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, I, can I just want to do one more quick one? Well, our, our customers, and like I said, we, we've, we, we see a range of people, they tend to go through a, a, a cloud migration progression, and that's not the word I'm looking for, evolution. The cloud is terrifying, we lose control of everything, we should never ever go there, it's awful. And we say, no, no, you know, it's gonna be really good, there's gonna be some really good things you get, and you're gonna get, for instance, you're gonna get access to the, the Microsoft security team that is so much better than your security team. So, you're gonna like the cloud. And then they, they work on that for a while, and then they go, the cloud, it solves all of our problems, it's amazing. And we're like, no, no, because of the shared responsibility model, you know, you, you can't just drop it in the cloud and expect that Microsoft is gonna, gonna make magic for you. You've still gotta like turn things on. There are controls, you've gotta select or else they don't work for you. Uh, you've still got to share some responsibility, right? You've still got to come up with your own access list. Microsoft doesn't know who's supposed to access your yeah. stuff. That's, so, And that's really key, that you have to know your products and what you're trying to put right. in the cloud. You have to understand how it works. So to a certain extent, you have to have sort of that governance over your data and your information so that you understand, okay, these are the rules when it's on-prem. I have to have something similar when it's in the cloud or figure out you know, what controls the cloud is going to provide and vice versa. Well, hold on a second. So you guys are telling me that I can't just set it and forget it, that it's not secure out of the box? <laughs> I actually got to put in some work to do it? What are we doing here? I, I, think, I think you guys are touching on a, a very interesting point of, of continuous monitoring. How do we not only deploy it securely but continue to monitor it and ensure it stays that way, which is which is one of the biggest challenges. And I think we've touched on a lot of them, but I wanna open it up to the panel to say, what are our biggest challenges and opportunities in cloud, especially government cloud in, in the current vernacular? So I, I actually got this question signed to me, so I did a lot more work on this than you might imagine. Go for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was, this was the one I was supposed to be prepared to answer. So. Um, my, my initial answer to this thing was, was security is underfunded, particularly as it goes to the cloud, but, but internally too. And I said, you know what, that's a terrible answer. People hate that answer because the answer is not throw money at this problem. 
At a minimum, you have to tell people where to throw their money. And then we've already talked about the cybersecurity workforce shortage. I think it's a terrible problem. I'm not sure it's the biggest one. Um, five years ago, if you'd asked me what the biggest problem in, in, the, in cybersecurity was, and that was before we had a lot of cloud talk, I'd have said it was management commitment to cybersecurity. Right? They just don't care. They don't believe it's a problem they need to solve. I think we're through that one. I think we're coming out the other side of that one. I think the problem that we can actually solve as members of the, of the, the, the IT and cybersecurity communities is we've got to figure out a way to communicate to management who are now committed to helping us what we want them to actually do. They're ready. They're ready to help. They're ready to make investments. They're ready to, to move to the cloud. They're ready to configure things correctly. They're ready to hire the people who will handle that stuff. But they don't know what to do. They're, they say it's their top priority. We had a slide up here earlier that was like, our cybersecurity is our number one priority. Well, that's great. What are you going to do about that? And most of them don't know. They don't have the faintest idea what to actually do. And as a community, what we need to do is communicate to them what they actually need to do about their cybersecurity problem now that they have the commitment. And I was kind of thinking um, off of what you were saying is, is in making sure that it's across the organization, that you don't make the cybersecurity problem just the cybersecurity folks that you hired that it has to be throughout your organization from the people who, you know, get your kit in hands of soldiers to the people who train them to the people who, you know, making sure all the patches and everything else gets down the line. Um, it, you know, all your logistics folks, it has to be part of your, your business folks because they need to make sure that, you know, it's funded for these various activities. And you know, sometimes that's a challenge that if you, you're you just telling the cybersecurity folks to make sure cybersecurity happens, but the rest of the organization is not aware of it and therefore they're not preparing for it as well. What I'm hearing a lot from the panel is, while there are several challenges and opportunities, strategy seems to be kind of a central point to say, you know, while there's different things that we'll overcome, starting with some form of a plan of action and strategy is, is often one of the biggest challenges. And, and Sean, I think you touched on it earlier as well, that, that you've never seen a plan to where what it was on paper is, is what it turned out to be. So I think mm -hmm. the ability to adapt and, and overcome in the cloud space is, is key. I think we have other seed questions, but I don't think it's fair to leave things on the table with the wealth of discussion that we've had so far. What I want to do before we close the panel today is, is go down the line and open it up for, for each of you guys to make comments and, and address anything we haven't touched on so far or maybe another point that you guys would like to reinforce before we close our panel. But Joe, can we start with you? Oh, perfect. All right. Joe? Uh, sure. <clears throat> so. Uh, one thing that uh, I was going to mention as far as, um, you know, um, opportunities and challenges is really uh, the, the desperation, if you will, for, uh, for solutions, um, particularly at the more um, strategic echelons of, of the U.S. government. I think uh, you really have to break it down by echelon to, to really um, understand the role of the feedback loops um, and the accountability. Uh, associated with each one of those echelons. So, for example, more at the at the tactical level, if you will, uh, where folks are are interacting with uh, with the uh, regular users and customers uh, on a very regular basis, particularly those who can walk up to them in real life. Um, that the accountability and the feedback there is is quite immediate and very strong. So you see a lot of uh, adapting and, and innovating to make things happen there. That being said, at the more strategic echelons of the government, um, where they're thinking about, okay, what programs or, or areas do we want to resource or prioritize more than others? Um, there, there's a, a huge amount of thirst or desperation for uh, new concepts, new solutions, new ideas, because they simply know that what's happening is not sustainable. We're, we're, there's a lot of room for improvement. I'll put it very politely um, with regards to the state of cybersecurity um, regarding the, uh, particularly the, the United States government. So I would encourage everybody um, to be that squeaky wheel and next time you hear of something that you think that needs to be included, 
uh, pick up the phone and, and call your congressperson or, or senator's office um, because they are receptive um, and you are their customer. They need to listen to you. Um, and if you are in a position of any kind of influence, whether that's on the industry side or in academia or whatever, uh, be that squeaky wheel because it all starts with a, an identified requirement and issue that then needs to be addressed. Uh, they are desperate for ideas. So provide them some ideas and, and even better, some solutions. Thank you, Joe. Denise? Um, um, wait, I'm wavering between two topics. Um, I guess, I guess the key thing is like, a lot of the key things that we need to do with regards to readiness for the cloud, we have to really think about what makes sense for tactical systems, right? Um, just because you know the cloud has a lot of advantages doesn't mean that your system should be in the cloud. And there really needs to be an assessment of what makes sense to move in the cloud versus what makes sense to not be in the cloud. And from the Army perspective and the tactical perspective, we have to kind of make those balances so that, that's really kind of what I want to kind of leave with is making sure we kind of move, make, move, make our movement to the cloud and make sure it makes sense. Make sure that it's balanced. Make sure it's thought through before we just throw stuff in the cloud and then all of a sudden the users that are dependent upon those services are, are failed. Fantastic. Thanks, Denise. Sean? Um, I think I just want to touch upon the opportunities, right? Uh, I think we talked opportunities versus challenges. I would say I'm very excited to see where we go from here. Um, I love seeing how the government's opening up more topics for, I guess, citizen feedback and participation, whether it's making federal acceptance easier, whether it's weighing in on certain large contracts or other migrations that they're pursuing. Don't want to get into details, but that's that's definitely the case. I think, and, and there are a lot of excited folks out there that, that have opinions, have strong opinions, and it's a good thing that they're all getting hurt. Um, that's one. The other is with the with the increasing sophistication and diversity of cloud native security capabilities across any of the large CSPs, right? And across how they're used. I'd really like to see how the government actually utilizes more of this and gets out of supplier fatigue and contracting fatigue. Because that takes away from the core of the business or the core of the mission. If you think about energizing that core and really focusing on the mission, it's exciting to see how that'll move forward. Great points. Thank you, Sean. Frank? I just want to build on the squeaky wheel thing. And, and what I'd say is, again, based on, on what we see from our customers, be the squeaky wheel, but be the squeaky wheel for the stuff that isn't sexy. Be the squeaky wheel for patching. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can solve what? 90% of the Clap in the audience. Clap in the audience. <laughs> you know? Thank you, Alex. Right. What, what's what? I've seen figures up to 99% of, of penetrations of data losses are are from from problems that are known sometimes for up to a year for which a solution exists. Right. Be the squeaky wheel for things that are not sexy. Thank you, Frank. I think we've got a moment now that we're going to open up the panel for questions. Uh, Karina, go ahead. And I want to get sure we get to networking. So. Um, and baseball. I, yes, and baseball. baseball. Yes, we, we we're, 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 we're well aware of that. So uh, thank you for the panelists uh, for coming today. That was amazing. Um, and then uh, I know it's Cyber Week, so thank you for participating. Um, again, if you have a speaker idea and want to share it, please let us know. Um, and uh, thank you for coming.